Hello and welcome to Scott Drive Church. If you're joining us for the first time, you're very, very welcome. Uh, we're a church in Exmouth in Devon. And we're looking today, celebrating Good Friday. And we're looking at, particularly at the cross. What was going on at the cross? What did it signify? What did it achieve? So first of all, I'm going to read a section from Mark's Gospel that talks about the cross. And we read in chapter 15 of Mark, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is a praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The, note, the written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled that says he was counted with the lawless ones. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down to the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, fill a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there, in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. So in this talk, I want to look at that verse, verse 34, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want to look at the very centre of our faith. What's happening at the cross? What does it sing signify? What does it achieve? What does it say about God and about us? And particularly, what about this terrible cry of desolation? What does it have to say to us? Now the word forsaken has a particularly bleak and melancholy sound to it. Imagine a town or a village forsaken by its inhabitants. What a lonely, what a desolate image. How much worse to imagine the forsaking of a person, a man forsaken by his friend, a woman forsaken by her husband, a child forsaken by its parents, but a man forsaken by God. How much more terrible again? Because for one who loves God, any break in fellowship is a terrible thing. One of the Psalms says, As a deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Fellowship with God should be the greatest desire and the sweetest pleasure of all Christians. How terrible, therefore, if one should feel that God had turned his back on him forsaken him. 
Yet hear the Lord, Lord Jesus cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What can be the reason? The first thing we need to understand is that our Lord is quoting scripture. These very words are found in Psalm 22 and verse 1. A thousand years before it happened, it was prophesied that the Christ would be forsaken by the Father. That Psalm, 30, Psalm 22 refers to Christ is proved by later verses that speak of the piercing of someone's hands and feet and the dividing of his clothes. In the light of what we've read, who else can the psalm be speaking of? But how can it be that God the Father should forsake God the Son? We learn from the scriptures that the Father and Son had been together in perfect harmony uh, <clears throat> from the, the very foundation of the world. Uh, in his great prayer in John chapter 17, the Lord Jesus says, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. It, and it was of the Lord Jesus that the Father says, this is my beloved Son, in him I am well pleased. And the Lord Jesus declared, the Father is always with me. So how could it be that the Father should forsake him? So in answering these que this question, I want to look at four important facts that we can observe at the cross. First of all, on the cross, we observe the awful nature of sin and the wages it pays. At the cross, we observe man's inhumanity to man. He was one who had gone about doing good. He gave sight to the blind, cleansing to the leper, food to the hungry. Yet ordinary people could be persuaded to cry out, crucify him, and insist that a criminal be freed and the sinless one condemned. And not content with merely killing him, the same people must mock him and rail at him as he hangs upon the cross. We read it just now. He saved others, but himself he can't save. Let this crisis, King of Israel, come down now from the cross, and so forth. Should we be surprised at this? I don't think so. Were there not ordinary, outwardly decent people living in Germany before the war? who became SS officers or commandants of concentration camps and participated in the deaths of millions? Could not ordinary people in Rwanda be persuaded to hack their neighbours in pieces with machetes? We can look at Cambodia. We can look at Syria in our own time, and Myanmar. Similar things are going on, even at this very moment. The heart of man, says the Bible, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible tells, tells us that sin separates us from God. Almost the first act of Adam and Eve when they fell into sin was to hide themselves from God. And Cain, after he'd murdered his brother, declared, I shall be hidden from your face. And sin has cursed the world. Unbelieving people often ask Christians, where's your God of love in the midst of all the suffering and pain in the world? I can't see him. What about all these floods? What about all these earthquakes? Why doesn't God do something about it? Now I'll come back to this presently, but for the moment we need to understand that the world is not as it was made when God created it and pronounced it very good. It is fallen, and it's fallen because of sin. And in amongst the wonder and the beauty of this world, there is ugliness and hardship and disease and death. Uh, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, says, uh, the creation was subjected to frustration, not from its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the Son of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And this is very much how it is in these times, and it is because of sin. Our Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. So when Christ suffers and he dies upon the cross, he is paying the wages of sin. Not his own, for he had none. 
He was, the Bible tells us, in all points tempted or tested, as we are, yet without sin. He had no sins to answer for. So he answered for us. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Secondly, on the cross, we see the absolute holiness and inflexible justice of God. There are two things that we need to know about God which seem to be forgotten by much of the church today. First of all, God is holy, utterly, utterly holy, which means he is separate, he is separate from sin. Almost the first thing that the Apostle John wants to tell us in his letter is the purity and the holiness of God. He writes, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Therefore, God can have no association with evil. The prophet Habakkuk declares of him, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness. The second thing we need to know is that God is utterly righteous. He must judge and punish sin. In Psalm 7, in verse 11, the Holy Spirit declares, God is a just judge. And I'm sure every professing Christian would agree with that. But he goes on, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God's anger against sin is unrelenting and it's also quite righteous. Sin must be paid for. If you uh, have had the uh, misfortune to, uh, while driving your car today, which I expect you shouldn't do, but if you did and you banged into someone else's car, then you and the other driver are going to survey the damage and you're going to think to yourself, even if you do not say, someone's going to have to pay for this. And if you have caused the accident, then you or your insurance company are going to have to pay. That is justice. The guilty party pays. Even secular people agree with the principle. People often become furious when guilty people are let off with a fine or a suspended sentence when they should have been sent to jail. The Daily Mail is constantly complaining about these things. Where's the justice, they ask, when some poor child has been killed by a drunken driver who gets away with a driving ban and a few months' community service. So it is right and proper that God should extract the full penalty for sin, which is death, eternal separation from God. The soul who sins shall die. Now, if that was the whole story, there would be no hope for any of us, because there is none righteous, no, not one. We all deserve eternal punishment from God, because we have not kept his laws properly. We are all mired in sin. Praise God. That's not the whole story. On the cross, we see God's plan of redemption. God is not only holy, not only righteous, he is also love. He does not want to punish sinners. Do I have any pleasure, he says, that the wicked should die and not that he should turn from his ways and live? I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. And the Bible also tells us that God devises ways so that a banished person does not remain estranged from him. But how can God be just and yet pardon guilty, hell-deserving sinners? Only through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has taken upon himself the debt that we cannot pay. He has taken the punishment that we deserve. The Bible tells us he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. The prophet Nahum asked, Who can stand before God's indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? Only the Lord Jesus Christ. There on the cross, all our sins were laid upon him. For God made him, says the Apostle Paul, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. But what did it mean? What did it mean that Christ was made sin? The prophet Isaiah tells us, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the sins of God's people down the ages were laid to his charge. And he was burdened with them. He was made the very epitome of sin. And the father who cannot look upon sin turned away. And the sign of this, 
as we read, the sky was darkened and he hung there desolate and forsaken with the baying, jeering mob all around, the people mocking, the Pharisees and the priests gloating and even the other men on the cross, we read, reviling him. The Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell and this is hell, pain and darkness and separation from God. These shall be punished, says the Apostle Paul, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And Christ, the sinless one, the innocent one, suffered all that we might be spared it. He suffered anguish that we might know the joy of sins forgiven. He was cast out that we might be brought in. He was treated as an enemy that we might be welcomed as friends. He surrendered to hell's worst, that we might attain heaven's best. He was stripped, that we might be clothed with righteousness. He was wounded, that we might be healed. He was made a shameful spectacle there on the cross, that we might inherit glory. He endured darkness, that we might experience eternal life. He wept, that all tears should be wiped from our eyes. He groaned that we might sing songs of praise. He endured all pain, that we might know endless health. He wore a crown of thorns, that we might wear a crown of victory. He bowed his head, that we might lift up ours in heaven. He died, that we might live forever. You see, there's a second part to the verse I quoted just now. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, it says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Just as all our sins were laid upon him, so his perfect righteousness and obedience are credited to us who believe. This is complete salvation. When God, the righteous judge of all the earth, looks at Christians, he doesn't see fallible sinners struggling and all too often failing to keep his laws. He sees us clad in the perfect robe of righteousness wrought for us by our Saviour. Again, the prophets tell us that all our righteous acts, our very best and highest, all the best things we can do, are like filthy rags before God. But Isaiah also says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. The perfect righteousness and obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ can clothe us, make us acceptable to God if we are united to Christ by our faith. And Jesus did it willingly. He says, therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. We should not suppose that by dying on the cross, the Lord Jesus extracted from the Father the salvation he was reluctant to give. No, the Father willingly gave his beloved Son. In this is love, says the Apostle John. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. It's true and gloriously so that the Father gave the Son. It is equally true and equally glorious but the Son gave himself willingly for our sakes. Lastly, on the cross, we see the love of God. You see, Christ's sufferings were not in vain. After three hours of darkness, at the ninth hour, the sun came through again, atonement had been made, justice had been satisfied. And Mark tells us that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and the Apostle John tells us what that cry was. It is finished. It is done. The sins of his people have been paid for. And again we read in the prophet Isaiah, although the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, that is, those for whom he died, and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So when people ask us, where's the love of God in the world? We must tell them that they're looking 
in the wrong place. In the love in the world, we can see the power and the wisdom, the kindness and the provision of God. But it is on the cross that we see his love. It is there that we must bid people look. And if they look sincerely, they will surely find it. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, with him, also give us all things? And there is this great promise in the Bible where God promises to us, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart and with all your soul. So we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy set before him, what was that? It was that of redeeming his people. But now he's no longer on the cross, but he's reigning in heaven, and he tells us everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. The price is paid. All may enter, whoever you are. You, whatever you've done, you are welcome. You, you come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He will not turn you away. I don't know who may be listening to this today or watching the video, but if there were swindlers and crooks, if there were child molesters, if there were Muslim suicide bombers, I would tell you, come to Jesus Christ. He promises he will not turn you away. But the Bible also says something else. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? We won't. Jesus Christ is not just a lifestyle accessory, not an optional extra that you can add to your life or not as you please. Not at all. The Bible asks, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who had trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing? and insulted the spirit of grace. It's not a matter of life and death. It's much more important than that. If Christ does not pay for your sins, then you must pay for them yourself. And though you spend an eternity of hell in hell, you will not have paid it in full. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Christ is speaking to you now through his word. He bids you repent and trust in him to salvation. Will you not hear? Christ calls to you. He says, look to me and be saved, all you end of the earth. Look to him, see him bleeding and dying, alone and forsaken on the cross, and believe that it was for you that he suffered. Turn from your sins. Turn from your old life. Come to Christ for salvation. Almost the last verses of the Bible say this. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The door to heaven is wide open today. Eternal life is there for the taking. The one who comes to me, says Jesus, I will by no means turn away. You can know the joy of sins forgiven. You can know the certainty of eternal life. Whatever this world throws at you, you can know that you are safe with God forever. This is what was accomplished there on Good Friday. Why not receive it for yourself?